Hey everyone, welcome back to Signal Processing with Paul. And in this video, we're gonna continue our discussion about the Fourier series. However, in this point, what we're gonna do is what I wanna do is talk about why the Fourier series actually works. So what are the reasons that it works the way it does to create the spectrum of the signal or the frequency components? And the main thing has to do with orthogonality. But what I wanna do is introduce the Fourier series a slightly different way. We've already talked about the intuition behind it and then introduced it. But now what I wanna do is kind of explain the mechanics now that you've kind of seen it and what's going on under the surface. So if you remember what you get is C sub K is equal to the integral from zero to T and we have one over T out in front. And this is going to be S of T times E to the minus J two pi K T over big T DT. So we integrate out T and we get our frequency components. And notice that K is an integer. And the reason for this has to do with the fact that if I have some signal over some period from zero to T, I can have these frequencies basically be, you can think of them as strings or, or frequencies or sine waves, but they're fixed at both ends. So you have some offset term, which is your zero frequency term. When you know when K equals zero, that would be this term, K equals zero. But then the rest of these happen when you fix zero and T. And this is why you have integer multiples. So what you're gonna have are things like this, you're gonna have your, you know, your frequency one term, then you're gonna have your frequency two term. And in either case, you're basically creating these, you know, you can keep, <laughs> you can keep going if you want to, you could basically have uh, the next one be just twice as fast. So it's basically holding this on both ends and you get K equals zero, K equals one, K equals two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to infinity. So why is it the case that we can find our C sub Ks using this expression? Now I want you to notice that this is actually an inner product. This is an inner product between S of T and our exponential E to the J two pi K T over T. Now what's going on here, notice how there's not a minus sign in this exponential and I'll explain the reason for that as we go along. So if you remember from linear algebra, or perhaps you haven't taken linear algebra, so you'll have to remember from maybe physics, if you have two vectors, the inner product of two vectors basically calculates how close each vectors are to each other. So if they're going in the same direction, you expect a large value, and if they aren't going in the same direction, you would accept, expect a really, really small value. So if we have two vectors, x and y, we often compute this inner product by just summing together, you know, i equals zero to n minus one if we have n components of x sub i times y of i. So you add the individual components together and if they both, if they're orthogonal, you know, you may have zero comma one and one comma zero. They're never going in the same direction at the same component, but if they are going in the same direction, you expect a large value for this. So what happens with, rather than, you know, individual components of vectors, we have vectors that are actually functions of time. So here's my time axis, and you have this, let's say this function, and then you have, you know, some other function that's doing something else. Well, the inner product, what we're going to have now is the inner product between some function, let's just say a of t and b of t, is equal to simply the integral over my time interval that I'm caring about of just the product of the two functions. So this just comes out of the fact that uh, rather than adding them, summing them together, we're doing a Riemann sum and we're simply just taking the inner product. And if these functions are complex, meaning one of them returns a complex value, what we need to do is we need to conjugate, or, sorry, conjugate one of these when we do the inner product. Because what we want is when we have two vectors, we want to basically have x transpose y in this case. And when we have complex vectors, this transpose is a conjugate transpose, often write, wrote as h for Hermitian transpose or a star for conjugate transpose. Now, the reason we do this, the reason we, we, we do this for complex numbers is we want a vector's inner product with itself. So let's say x with itself to be equal to the magnitude of x squared or the two norm of x squared. And in the case of functions, we want it to literally be the power of the function. We're taking the inner product with itself. And if you remember from complex numbers, if I wanna get the magnitude of a complex vector z squared, what this is going to equal is z times z conjugate. Or if in we have the case of exponentials, if these are written in polar form, we're gonna have a e to the j, you know, two pi, or maybe I'll just do it this way, a e to the j theta, times a e to the minus j theta, such that these guys cancel out to become one and you get 
a squared. So the magnitude is of course the square root of a squared, so the magnitude squared is going to be a squared as we desire. And similarly, when we take basically two complex functions, c1 of t and c2 of t, and we take this inner product, what we're going to do is we're going to take the integral over the range of my function, and we're gonna do c1 of t times c2 of t, and you need to conjugate one of these. It doesn't matter which one you do because these are symmetric, the inner product is symmetric, so you could always swap them. And so for the sake, for the purposes that we care about, it doesn't really matter, but for consistency sake, we often conjugate the second component. So hopefully you can see now that the c sub k's that we create are literally done. Each one is taken by taking an inner product of my function with that sine wave at a particular frequency. So you can imagine if I have some function here doing this particular thing, each k tells me, basically if I was to take this and multiply it by this function at each particular point, tells me how much of that frequency component is present in my signal. In many ways, it's like I have some dish and I'm able to find, well, how much sugar, how, much e how many eggs did I put in here, how much flour did I put in here by just tasting the dish and, and basically looking at an egg and saying, how many eggs did I put in this dish? Now, the reason this works, the reason we can do it this way is because these different frequency components are orthogonal. In fact, they're orthonormal, but they really are orthogonal. And the one over T is what makes it orthonormal. So we'll talk about that in a second. But suffice it to say that this works because if I was gonna try to find out, you know, how much sugar I put in, and I had both my sugar ingredient and I had some other ingredient that also had some sugar in it, I would need to separate out the individual ingredients that I added together to find out how many actual sugar packets I put in and how much of the sugar was due to, let's say, I also put in some icing that had sugar or some, some milk that had some sweetener in it or something. So you would need these components to be independent of each other if you were trying to find the individual pieces that make them up. And sure enough, I'm going to show you that these individual frequencies, when they're not the same, these, these frequencies are indeed independent or orthogonal or yeah, basically, um, yeah, independent of each other is the way to put it. So to do this, what I wanna do is take a look at the inner product between E to the J two pi K T over T and E to the J two pi L T over t. And we're going to have two cases. We're going to have the case where um, k equals l and the case where k does not equals l. So first off, we're going to just write this as the integral. So this is going to be 1 over t times the integral. This 1 over t, you, you, we don't need to put it here. So for now, I'm not going to put it here and I'll explain later why we, why we have it. So we're gonna have e to the j two pi kt over t. And then because we have to conjugate the other one, to make this a valid inner product, e to the minus j 2 pi lt over t. And this is, of course, with respect to time. This is over time. And what this really means is this is the integral from 0 to t of e to the j 2 pi t over big T times quantity k minus l with respect to t. Now, we're going to have two cases. We're gonna have when k does not equal l, of course these two are integers, and we're gonna have when k equals l. So let's look at case one. k does not equal l. So in this case, what we have is we have the integral from zero to t of e to the j two pi t over t times k minus l with respect to t. Now, what I want you to notice is with this integral, we can do a u substitution. I'm actually gonna work this out this time, but hopefully you can convince yourself that this is easy to do the case. But what I'm gonna do is say, let me let u equal j two pi t k minus l all over big T. So that way du is going to equal j two pi times k minus l dt, and this is all over big T. So if I wanna substitute this in for dt, and I have my new variable of integration, what this really is, is equal to the integral from zero to t. Now I'm gonna have new integrands, but I'm just gonna leave them alone and substitute them back in. e to the u times, now we need to just take the reciprocal, t over j two pi times k minus l du. Of course, none of this stuff depends on u, so it can come out. And what we have by completing the integral is just t over 
j 2 pi times k minus l e to the u evaluated from 0 to t, but this is not just e to the u, this is actually e to the j 2 pi t over big T times k minus l, and this is evaluated from t equals 0 to t equals t. So sure enough, just substituting this in, what this becomes is t over j 2 pi times k minus l, and then it's we're going to have now, when, when, this, when t equals t, we're going to have e to the j 2 pi t over t. So this is going to be e to the j 2 pi times k minus l. And then we're going to subtract. Now, e to the j 2 pi, well, t equals 0. This is just e to the 0 because, you know, we're going to have 0 in the numerator. And we're going to have, so this is just going to be minus 1. Now, what I want you to note here is k and l are two integers. Right, because we had our frequencies, so you know these were k equals zero, k equals one, k equals two, etc. So the difference between two integers here is going to be an integer. So this, right here, this is an integer, and we can write this as e to the j two pi, quantity to the k minus l, where k minus l is of course some integer. Now look at what a e to the j two pi is. If you think about it and you look at it, well this is simply the number one because I'm taking the number one and I'm rotating it around 2 pi around, and sure enough, I'm back at my number 1. And 1 to any integer power is 1. So what we get here is 1 minus 1, which sure enough becomes 0. So in case 1, when k does not equal l, we get 0. Now let's come back to this expression here, and let's look at what happens when k equals l. So this is going to be case 2, k equals L. Well, when k equals L, <laughs> the numerator of this exponential is simply 0, and what we have here is the integral from 0 to t of basically 1, because e to the 0 is 1, dt, which equals, of course, t evaluated from 0 to t, which equals t. So when I take the inner, the inner product from e to the j 2 pi k t over t and e to the j 2 pi lt, oops, I got these two backwards. This is little t over big T and e to the j 2 pi lt over t. This basically equals zero if k does not equal l and big T if k equals l. And to make these orthonormal, all we need to do is basically just divide by 1 over t in front. And if we do that, then not only is the inner product going to be t, but it's going to be 1 if we, of course, have a 1 over t out in front. So what we've done here is we've added the 1 over t, and because these guys are orthonormal, because each component was orthogonal at different frequencies, it's very easy for us to find the frequency component of each signal. We simply take the inner product of our signal s of t with each of these frequency components. So hopefully this will give you an understanding or an appreciation for the orthonormality principle of the Fourier series. This is also the case in the Fourier transform, but I think it's easiest to see here with the Fourier series when you have a finite amount of time. And just remember that the Fourier series or the, and the Fourier transform for that matter is simply just an inner product of your signal with different frequency components. It's like asking how much of my signal is going along with this frequency versus this frequency. And because if you take the integral of any of these frequencies individually, you get zero, except the one with itself, of course. Um, that's what allows us to do this in this very simple way without needing to basically think about the confounding effects of other frequencies. So hope you found this helpful and I will see you in the next video.